back to Empire with me, Anita Arnon. And me, William Durimple. Yeah, just say, it has, it has not gone unnoticed how well you do that now. <laughs> I, mean, it's, it's I, I sit here with my family practicing it morning after yeah. morning. Yeah, no, I'm proud of you. I am very proud of you. Uh, we're, we're back on the um, path of gore. <laughs> Aren't we again this week? This is another special week of Koenor where we throw two episodes <laughs> dripping in blood at you. <laughs> and this episode, episode three, uh, contains your favourite bit of eater, the roulette wheel of death, as you used to call it on our lecture tour. I tell you what, <laughs> there, there is an awful lot of killing, <laughs> shooting and a stabbing and a poisoning that goes on in this particular bit. Bludgeoning? Uh, a bludgeoning there's, also bludge- there's also a share of bludgeoning. I mean, basically, you name it. If Angela Lansbury were here, murder she wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote, because there's a lot, <laughs> is what I'd say. So, just to, for those of you who who weren't up to speed, this is the third episode of our four part series on the Kohenor Diamond. In the first two episodes of this series, we took you through the history of this diamond, which in many ways is a symbol of the complexity of empire and empires. Many different peoples, many different kingdoms regard this diamond as their own. Uh, many have fought for it, uh, and many still want it back, particularly, uh, most obviously, uh, India and Pakistan, but also Iran, Afghanistan and Bangladesh. Um, and uh, the, even the Taliban have put in a claim uh, for the uh, <laughs> for this diamond. I think, I think it's safe to say they're the least likely to get it back, <laughs> I think. I think it's gonna have, any of it's going to happen very soon. But it's a, I think it's a very good place to start uh, a podcast on empire because it, it, it it's not only a diamond which overlaps with so many different empires but it's also one which symbolizes in a sense the heart of the imperial debate today which is which is what is the consequence of of centuries of colonialism particularly european colonialism and uh, sh- should we be looking at some sort of uh, reparations in, in britain should we be educating ourselves more about the consequences of, of centuries of loot and asset stripping from other parts of the world how does one deal with the legacy of empire all this is bound up in one tiny little stone yeah and although you know both william and i in in many respects are, are artifacts of empire. <laughs> I mean, artifacts or rubble No one's put from us on a, on a nice purple cushion. <laughs> no, not yet. <laughs> yet. Um, but we're, we're talking about more than just the British Empire and the British relationship with India. So we will, throughout this podcast series, be looking at empires from across the globe. But as William said, you know, just think of the Koh-i-Noor in this respect as the most dripping with gore baton <laughs> in a relay race. It's a very nice just image, you, Anita. It's a, well, it's a very mean, gorgeous thing for <laughs> our listeners to wake up and uh, think about. <laughs> but, it, you know, and it gives us an excuse to do a romp through centuries. So where did we leave off uh, the last episode? We left episode? off with the death of Ranjit Singh. Now, Ranjit Singh had taken the diamond from the Afghans, from Shah Shuja Mulk, when he was in his captivity. According to Shah Shuja, he tortured his son in front of him. But this is by no means the end of uh, of of the relay race of gore, as my <laughs> co-presenter so elegantly puts it. In fact, it's the beginning of what is probably the fastest uh, moment of uh, terrible events in the whole history of the diamond, which is the uh, the bit that you are, I think, going to open I with, am, Anita. I am, I am. I mean, really fasten your seatbelts and have a sick bag. Um, so... <laughs> <laughs> Ranjit Singh <laughs> closes his eyes. Apologies for me if you're watching this at breakfast or listening to this at breakfast. Um, clo- so Ranjit Singh has just closed his eyes. He is the one man who's managed to be a custodian of this diamond without meeting some tragic, horrific and deforming death. Um, but when he closes his eyes, everybody knows that there's going to be a scramble for power. But nobody knows where the Koenor diamond has gone. Um, And because this is a gem of state, that is of great interest to a great many people. The mystery can be solved through one actually quite minor court official in the court of uh, Lahore. And it is that man, Beli Ram. If you were listening to the last podcast, you'll know this was the man who was the head who looked after the Toshakhana, the treasure house of Ranjit Singh. It was his responsibility whenever Ranjit Singh went riding around his empire on his elephant to make sure that nobody nicked the Kohenor diamond. He slept with it. He would have slit the throat of anyone who came near it. But Beli Ram is the man who, as soon as Ranjit Singh breathes his last, takes the diamond and hides it. And he hides it for a very good reason, doesn't he? Because there is a very controversial episode, William, on his deathbed, on Ranjit Singh's deathbed, which until today is contested. It's an interesting episode because 
what Ranjit Singh wants to do is to leave the diamond to a famous temple in Orissa, the Jagannath temple. So the priests say. I mean, you ought to add, because this is, this is something that others say, Mm-mm, he couldn't even talk. He'd had a catastrophic stroke. So how I did have, he do it? I have half a memory mm. um, reading the court. Um, we wrote this book a few years ago, but I remember reading the court diary, and I think it's in there, for better or worse. That, and he says, I'm going to give it to Lord Jagannath. He doesn't name the temple itself, but um, what's interesting also is that theologically this is quite complicated for Sikhs because uh, modern Sikhism um, abjures all idolatry Any and, idolatry. and, and Hindu gods. Yeah. But if you go to uh, 18th and 19th century Sikh Gurdwaras, there's plenty of images of Hindu gods. And we know for a fact that uh, Ranjit Singh, when he died, died looking at a, a, an image, I think, of Ram and Sita. Yeah, So, but this is something that's contested by the Sikhs, who say, actually, yeah. it's impossible, even if it's inserted into the court records, it's inserted by nefar- It's It's been inserted in nefarious ways, because number one, he was a Sikh. Why would he be giving the most precious diamond of the kingdom to a Sikh, tem- uh, to a Hindu temple? And number two, he couldn't talk. He couldn't speak on his deathbed. So, so anyway, even on this, his deathbed, there, to, there is a controversy about it. Put the case for, for, for it being true for one second, because it's controversial and, and very interesting matter, this. And, and I think the first people who actually put in the claim in 1947 for the return of the diamond from Britain mm. was not the Indian government, but the Jagannath the Temple. Jagannath in Orissa. Correct. That's right. And yeah. when I gave this talk once in Orissa, uh, all the Orissans were very clear that it was their specific sure. diamond. That this, It wasn't belonging to India. It was belonging to Orissa and this yeah. temple. Um, it is interesting because you, I remember you saying earlier that Sikhism is, is almost like a form of Protestantism. Um, that's certainly the modern understanding of, of Sikhs. And, and Gurdwaras are very bare and there are no images, uh, particularly in diaspora, um, Gurdwaras in, in this country, in Britain. But what is interesting is that in the 18th and 19th century, if you go around a lot of old uh, Sikh gurdwaras that are images uh, of Hindu gods, not necessarily in the main prayer hall, but in the uh, in the, the buildings around by uh, and in the, in the gatehouses, in the uh, in in the residential quarters, and so on. And what has happened in the twentieth century is that reforming Sikhs have often whitewashed these. Mm-hmm. And this happened at the Golden Temple, and there are images, for example, of the gateway into the Golden Temple, which have many of these images in the early True. early twentieth century, uh, now completely bare. Mm. And there's been a very important destruction of Sikh art. Uh, across Pakistan lately by diaspora Sikhs wanting to do the best thing and raising money to renovate uh, old Gurdwaras that had not been touched since partition. Mm. And they've whitewashed many of the frescoes there in, in the last two, three years. And and so this so the fact that he gave it to the Jagannath Temple is is, is is a doubly complicated and, thing. And I'm going yes. to argue against, yeah. you know, the, the position that, that is is argued by the Sikhs, certainly, who say with as much gusto as those in Orissa, it's our stone, give <laughs> yeah. it back to us. Don't give it back to India, give it back to the Sikhs. Is that actually Ranjit Singh was a very unusual Sikh leader because he married wives from different religions. So he had Hindu wives, he had Muslim wives, and he was the the first person who ruled that part of um, the kingdom, the north of India. Um, but the thing is that he is is a man who is a polymath. He's also accepting of different religions and different faiths in a way that none of his predecessors for hundreds of years have been. So you, William talked about the jizya tax, which had been imposed by the Mughals, which was if you were not a Muslim and you wanted to practice your own, yeah. by some of the Mughals, you wanted to practice your own religion, you would have to pay a tax. Whereas when Ranjit Singh comes to the throne, he says no jizya. That's it. You worship the way you want. You do what you like. So it's possible that he wanted to give it to Jagannath. Anyway, the point is, who cares? Because where's the diamond? <laughs> it's not here. So so let's get back to Belly Ram. Then Belly Ram, despite the potential de- dying wishes of his master, for whom he would have spilt blood and died, has decided no. Even if Ranjit Singh has given this stone over, it wasn't his to give. So this minor, imagine the guts on this man, this minor court official has taken his duty of state so seriously. He is the son of the man who looked after the Toshakana. His children are working in the Toshakana. This is the family business. But he says no, and he doesn't take it for himself. He hides it away because he says the man who takes over as the Maharaja, this is his gem and I will hide it until then. You know, this is... This is extraordinary. Uh, the next man, by the way, who is, is entitled Just to wear before it. before we finish uh, Belly Mr. Ram, rather bizarrely, I was giving a lecture on this uh, one afternoon when his entire family turned up. 
uh, at the reading. You never I'm, told a, me. I'm a very, pr- I'm a very proud of it, and they've this have, is great. and they've got documents and all sorts of stuff. If we want to do oh, any well, more, you've been very nice. Come, you're just telling me this now. <laughs> just, just anything else you want to mention? God. So, what did they? I mean, did they know how they brave? Knew the story. And they and, were very proud and, of his and, bravery. And, and, and because I'd mentioned him in, yeah. in, in the talk, uh, they came up afterwards and said, actually. Uh, and they were refugees from partition. They'd come over the border in 1947 and now living in Gulgan. So they'd, li- they'd been living in Lahore all that time. Living in Lahore, right up until Isn't 47. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So it's hidden. No diamond, no king, no diamond, no <laughs> diamond, no king. That's what Belly Ram has decided. Um, but the next man who is entitled to wear that diamond, in the view of most of the people in the court of Lahore, is not fit to wear it. His name is Karak Singh, who's the oldest son from the first wife, of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. And this man is, well, you know how we've sort of described um, Rangila, who I liked, who's the party, party central. He's a little bit like that, and the Sikhs really don't like it. Um, Emily Eden, who's a great adventuress and a historian and a travel writer at the time. She's quite magnificent. She does sketches around India and writes about it. Describes a very him. piquant uh, yeah. oh, travel writer and skewers everybody and with her she's quite tight wasp, little sentences. Very waspish. Yeah. She describes Karak Singh as an opium-eating blockhead. <laughs> <laughs> That's you, quite charitable in her, <laughs> in her lexicon. She, she must have liked him. But, uh, but, you know, not wrong, because this was a man who preferred his own pleasure to matters of state. Um, as soon as he becomes Maharaja, woohoo! <laughs> you know, weeks of Not over-endowed with intellect either, it should be said. No. Yeah. Bl- hence blockhead. <laughs> I think. Covers that. Yeah. Covers that, that base. Um, so he is barely on on the golden guddi because he decides he will sit on the throne that his father doesn't sit on his father if you remember ranjit singh leaves it empty for guru nanak the founder of the sikh faith but karak singh parks is fairly wide bottom on it and is comfortable but almost immediately his uh, nobles decide he's got to go and they start to poison him gradually slowly over months by a mixture of um, white lead and camphor, rus camphor, which it's isn't called. a very nice way to go. No, just I mean, you know what it does to a, a human body. It's it's, to, it's tell, not that you've poisoned us. anyone. <laughs> I know not that you've done it, <laughs> but it's it, it's slowly it, it's it's a, a neurotoxin. So it slowly robs a person of their faculties. Now, Karak Singh it doesn't help his his own situation because he drinks a lot. He's sort of you know decried as a notorious drunk. Um, so, you know, when he starts to wobble a bit on his feet, nobody really notices or cares because he's always been wobbling, he's quite been a lot. wobbling for months. <laughs> he starts to slur. Um, nobody really is that bothered because it's not unknown for him to <laughs> be slurry. a bit slurry. Um, but it's when he starts having terrible shooting pains in his fingers and his toes, which then spreads through his body. Then he loses the ability to walk. Then he cannot, and he's in screaming pain, like a thousand needles are pricking his skin all the time. And he is just taken off and put to bed. He's still the king until he dies, but he's out of the way. And the nobles are basically the ones who are responsible for this poison plot, are waiting for his son, who is a much more. And is Karak Singh wearing the Kohinoor as he's having. He, he wears it when there are state occasions, so when he is in front of the Lahore Darbar, but when he's sick, I mean, it would have been. It's, it would have been taken away again, belly round probably, you know, again, looking after it because, you know, they, one one supposes they don't sleep with it on. <laughs> it's like it's uncomfortable. <laughs> so, you know, um, so it's safely away from him, but it's waiting for a better recipient. And the better recipient is a 19-year-old boy called Nornihar Singh, who is Karak Singh's eldest son, who, unlike Karak Singh, is very responsible. Also rather beautiful in the miniatures. He's very, very beautiful. Very, very good-looking boy. He's got this sort of, you know, the, the very traditional North Indian features, sort of very aquiline nose, fair skin, um, angular, angular, lean and fit. Whereas Karak Singh is this gnarly bearded, wide Old load. uncle. Old yeah. uncle, <laughs> yes, exactly. So Karak Singh finally does die. And uh, Nornihal is about to be 
we don't crown them as king, but anointed as the new Maharaja. He doesn't make it past his father's funeral, William. <laughs> Not even past his father's funeral. The curse of the going all strikes again. Well, that's, that's this is why this starts uh, gaining this particular this period, momentum start really it, starts it? Yeah. To, to, to stick that reputation. So Nornihal has just cremated his father. So he's covered in the ash and dust of the cremation. He goes to wash his hands in the river and he comes back to the palace now he's going to walk through the palace in through the the royal gardens through a major gateway called the Hazuri Bagh gate which was built i think by ranjit singh to celebrate his capture of the Kohinoor from Shah Shuja. Absolutely. Yeah. So I mean, everything comes back to the Kohinoor. So Nonihal, with two of his uh, retainers, is, is walking through the Hazuri Bar gate, making his way to the palace. And suddenly, and completely inexplicably, a large block from the Hazuri gate falls and it hits him. And his companion kills his companion outright, who's, who's also a blood relative, a cousin of his. But... According to the court records at the time, and an eyewitness, do you remember we talked about Alexander Gardner? The tartan turban. The tartan turban, well, mercenary <laughs> who was working for Ranjit Singh. He is an eyewitness to this. He's walking just a few paces behind Nornihal Singh, the, the crown prince, the Maharaja to be. And he says, you know, actually, Nornihal gets up. And he's really grumpy because it's, you know, probably not lovely to watch your cousin bludgeon to death by this great block. But he's OK. And he he's offered a palaquin to take him away. And he says, no, no, I'm walking. And he walks back, which makes what happens next. All the so more suspicious. Suspicious. Very suspect. Because later that night, a physician uh, called uh, another Western physician, he's actually a homeopath called Honigberger, goes to see We should him. say that the, the Sikh court is full of these sort of strange Europeans who've turned yeah. up, crossed through Europe and, and across Asia. Adventurers, actually, yeah. And there's these strange ex-Napoleonic generals who've married Sikh women, have got huge uh, families living in old Mughal tombs with long beards. Mm. Some of them ret uh, return eventually and, and, and spend their days eccentrically in Saint-Tropez with these, with these huge Sikh families. Uh, and one of them is Honigberger. And Honigberger spent a lot of time in the northwest frontier digging early Buddhist remains. And he's yeah. a very important archaeologist. In fact, when you go to the Ashmolean and to the uh, to, to the Pergamon Museum in Berlin, you see a lot of uh, Honigberger's early, I mean, he's been looting and digging very unscientifically through these beautiful uh, Hellenistic uh, stupas, these very earliest Buddhist remains. But in this uh, uh, part of the story, he's he's doing his his job, which yes, is yes, he's going a, to go and visit Nonaha to yeah. see if he's all right. Exactly. When he goes, he's not all right. <laughs> far from <laughs> he's it. Far from all right, <laughs> because he's lying dead in his bedchamber and his head has been caved in, and there's grey matter. He describes grey matter being spilt on the pillow now. How is that possible that a man who walked away from a glancing blow, from a falling, mysteriously falling piece of masonry, is now has his brain splattered all over the bed? So this has clearly been yet another murder. Two kings in one fell swoop have gone. So this idea of the, you know, the Kohenor wreaking havoc... Already, you know, Ranjit Singh was strong enough. The lion of Punjab was strong enough to wear it. But let's see about his cubs. This is also the period that you begin to get some Hindu writers uh, suggesting that because of this history of bloodshed, that this is the Simantika gem we talked of in yeah. the first episode, that, that clearly the Kohinoor's old name was the Simantika gem because like the Simantika gem, it leaves this trail of bloodshed wherever it goes, whatever the empire, whatever the period of history. Uh, it's done this extraordinary uh, work of dividing people and, yeah. and, and creating conflict. Yeah, and let, let's not forget, you know, a lion ate it and then a bear ate the lion. <laughs> so this is like it's a diamond that's got, this is the got bug, four. I need to say the Bhagavad Puran, <laughs> which is uh, from about the 10th century AD, we have mm. the story about the Samantica Joe. Anyway, to, go back, go to, back to episode court. one if yeah. you want to hear that. It's, it's a fun story. Um, so look, this is now a Lahore in absolute crisis because what are they going to do? Who is going to lead now? There are many queens of Ranjit Singh with many heirs and if they decide that they're all going to fight for this there's going to be a bloodbath so Karak Singh the dead Maharaja the one who was poisoned with uh, white lead and rust comfort his wife is a woman called Chand Kaur her son has just died Nonihal Singh has just died but she decides we have to keep this in the family. My God, we've got to keep this in the family because there are other sons who are going to converge on the Circling capital. The, the like sharks. Yeah. Yeah. So she orders the gates of the Lahore fort to be closed because she has Nornihal's wife, this young woman, and she's pregnant. And Chand Kaur is gambling everything that the child growing in her daughter-in-law's belly will be a boy. 
please let it be a boy, let it be a boy, let it be. And you know, Lahore's just, just simmering with tension, but they're waiting. Because if it's a boy, there is a clear line of succession here. And if there's nothing, then anarchy could break out. Absolutely. And the British are waiting just over the sutlage. <laughs> well, you're right, because yeah. the British, and just remind people, while Ranjit Singh's been on the throne, they haven't been able to get a sniff of the north, have they? So Ranjit Singh controls what is arguably the richest agricultural land in the whole of India, the Punjab. And while he has been consolidating this this empire with, with quite clear boundaries, the, the ocean to the south, the... Uh, Himalayas and Afghanistan to the north, the Khyber Pass is his northern boundary, and with uh, the Sutlej River marking him off from the rest of India. While this has been going on, a commercial company, the East India Company, has been using Indian mercenaries and borrowing money from Indian bankers to conquer the rest of India. And they've mm. hoovered up an incredible amount of territory. One man, uh, forgotten now, never appears in any uh, European or English textbooks, but uh, Lord Wellesley, who's the elder brother of the Duke of Wellington, conquers more of India than Napoleon conquers of Europe. Oh, that's a great period. fact. Uh, and he, with, in the series of wars from 1798 to 1805, Wellesley uh, destroys the Maratha Confederacy, destroys Tipu Sultan. All this is done with incredible speed, so that by the time that Ranjit Singh is dead, the whole of the rest of India is either controlled mm. by the East India Company directly through through direct rule or through a network of alliances with Indian princes who have all uh, assigned acts of submission. But this holdout citadel in the north, it just won't budge and they won't they won't go near and it under because Ranjit they know. Singh it was fine it was safe and it had these Napoleonic generals it had this incredible army it but had now, guns it had technology it had tech it had fighters it, but, but but now, now there's like chaos the Tory, it's like the Tory party <laughs> it's like keeps, this, this bag. keep bringing this analogy <laughs> this, I mean, it is it's like a, it's like a sort of bag of ferrets mm -hmm. yeah. um so there is Jan Kaur looking at her daughter-in-law swollen belly going please let it be a boy let it be a boy is it going to be a boy join us after the break to find out Welcome back to Empire, uh, the podcast about empires rising, falling with me, Anita Anand. And me, William Dalrymple. So we left you just before the break with um, the most pressured mother-to-be <laughs> who is sitting there cradling a swollen belly with her mother-in-law going, you better be a boy, <laughs> otherwise we're done for. That happens anyway in most situations. <laughs> True. Uh, but the whole of Lahore as well, simmering, praying and whatever temples or mosques they they go to or gurdwaras they go to so let it be a boy and it's a boy but, but it is a stillborn boy chant knows that's it the jig is up it will be a matter of hours before Sher singh who is the next legitimate claimant to the throne is going to be on the march from his ancestral homeland in batala which is a you know, Sher Singh, we should say, is, is the kind of ultimate, uh, the, the picture of him is the ultimate sort of man you don't want to sit next to in the tube. Isn't no, he, he, he's man, sitting there. Man spread somewhat, doesn't he? A little bit. I mean, he's imagine Brian Blessed <laughs> with a bigger, bushier, blacker beard. I mean, that's for, for, taking for, up two seats for the, for the Western audiences. You know what we're saying. So she knows he's going to, Sher Singh is on, on the way. And she orders the gates of Lahore Fort to be closed. People come terrified into the fort. Save us, save us. Those who are left outside like, oh dear, <laughs> what's going to happen here? And sure enough, Sher Singh lays siege to Lahore. Now, it's not, it's not a long siege, but it's a brutal siege. And there are people that, you know, the people of Lahore are hammering on the gates saying, please open the gates, open the gates, let him in, let him in. We can't tolerate this. And with great reluctance, Chand Kaur, the Queen Mother, who has now lost in short order, let's remind ourselves, a husband, a son, and a grandson, is ripped with grief, frightened for her life and her daughter-in-law's life, and says, I will open the gates if we make a deal. You have to let us out, Sher Singh, and we will never trouble you again, but you are not to bother us again. And he says, fine, that sounds fair to me. Let me in. And she opens the gates. She's allowed to leave with her retinue, her daughter-in-law with her. And it seems like everything is settled. You know, Lahore has stability. It's not a year goes by when Chand Kaur is sitting in her own palace. 
she's supposedly in retirement and her maids are brushing out her hair you know, they're putting oil in her hair they're brushing it out and this isn't going to end happily i can tell well <laughs> you're not wrong because <laughs> suddenly and without warning these handmaids pull out from behind their backs bricks and they bludgeon the queen mother to death now could this be a mystery? It could have been. However, <laughs> these women um, are dragged off by uh, the vizier of, because actually conveniently, Sher Singh is not in Lahore at the time this happens. He conveniently is not there. He's on a hunting expedition. So he can, he can turn around and say, not me, Gov. It's nothing to do with me. However, what they do to these poor women is they chop off their hands and they throw them outside the city gates. Honigberger, the, the physician that we're talking about, who keeps a great contemporaneous record of what's going on at this time, says, actually, you know, they chopped off their hands, but they would have been better off ripping out their tongues because the whole time they were screaming, Cher Singh made us do it. Cher Singh paid us to do this. So there we are. The Queen Mother has gone... Does Cher Singh have a long and happy life with well, Kohenor? it's funny you should say that. <laughs> <Does> <laughs> he? Because weirdly he? enough, Cher Singh doesn't. Hmm. Despite being this this sort of mountain of of, of Sikh manhood and, and, and spreading his legs and uh, wearing yeah. the Kohenor on his arm in his portrait. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you know, another another man, the virility of the, the Kohenor, the muscularity of the Kohenor, you see it in court at, paintings at this at period, the time. a wonderful portrait painter turns up, I think from Austria, called August Schöft. Yeah. And paints the whole uh, Derbar. So amid all this swirl of bloodshed, not only do we have these fantastic records from Honigberger, we also have this astonishing series of portraits by Schöft. Uh, and, and he's the guy that paints this sort of <laughs> fantastically sort of male picture of, uh, uh, of Cher Singh. Yeah. But he does it just at the right moment because Cher Singh is not around for long. No, <laughs> it's good he didn't hang about, frankly. Uh, because um, on, on the 15th of September, 1843, as you do a little date market here, this is where we are, Cher Singh is in his summer palace and he's invited his cousins round and his cousins are saying, look, I'm, you, we, you've got to invite us round because we've got these new fowling pistols. We want to show you these fowling pistols. He's a very keen hunter, is Cher Singh, as you'd expect with a man who takes up two seats on the tube. And he likes hunting and a fishing, mostly hunting. And so they want to show him these guns and all of a sudden they bang. <laughs> surprise, surprise, it goes off. One goes off in his chest. Um, and the cousins turn around and say, oopsie. <laughs> that <laughs> was, it was an accident. But they really can't explain how bang, it goes off <laughs> for a second time in his face. And the crown prince, Cher Singh's own son, is um, found dead elsewhere in the palace and he's been hacked to pieces. So who, on, on the basis of uh, uh, la Femme, where's, where's the, uh, who gains from this murder? Well, there, there, is, there is a period of bloodletting in the Lahore Darbar. Surprise, surprise. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> surprise. Where people who are vying for, for this diamond or for primacy in Lahore are just happily shooting, poisoning and chopping each other up. And the last man standing in 1843 is not a man at all. He's a little boy. Chubby-cheeked. He's a chubby-cheeked, doe-eyed little boy of... Five years old, long eyelashes, beautiful. This child is a beautiful, beautiful child. And his name is Dilip Singh. He's the youngest son of Maharaja Ranjit Singh from his youngest wife. This was not a kid who was ever meant to be king. And the mother is an extraordinary figure. She's a great beauty for a start, uh, but she's not from the courtly class. Her dad was, I think, the kept the hounds of the kennels. He is the he? kennel keepers. She's the kennel keepers' daughter. So her father was actually, I think, just quite a dreadful man called Olak Singh, who looked after the hunting hounds for Ranjit Singh. And from the time she's a child, basically this beautiful, celebrated beauty, um, just prepubescent and lovely, runs beside his master's horse saying. Do you want to? Do you want to feel more virile and young? Uh, in that case, why don't you marry my young daughter? She'll put fire back into your loins. She'll, and even Ranjit you know. Singh says no, age ten. Yeah, um, no, absolutely no. Yeah. And so Olak Singh asks, uh, you know, again and again and again, and only when she's sixteen years old does Maharaja Ranjit Singh say yes, I will marry her, and he marries this woman, Jindan Rani. Jindan is her name. And Rani Jindan becomes the mockery of the court because she's just the kennel keeper's girl. So, you know, she's kind of snubbed and shunned and not taken seriously at all. But she turns into one of the most remarkable women in the whole story. She is not a woman who is easily pushed aside. She's, she's, she's amazing. She's one of my favourite characters in history. But her, her little son is also mocked 
and teased. Because for a while, people say, how could the gnarled old Ranjit Singh, first of all, have produced an heir at all, because he's so old, Second of all, a, a, a child of such beauty. And they start rumours and gossip. And we should say this is a, a face that many people will actually know, yeah. uh, many listeners will know, because of the famous portrait of him done later in life uh, by Winterhausen. Winterhalter, uh, yes, Winterhalter. Winterhalter in, yes, in Osborne was, House. For example, on the front of, mm. of, of the great Raj exhibition at the National Portrait Gallery, yeah. it's sometimes regarded as the greatest portrait to come out of the entire period of it is, British it is India. It is stunning, yeah. it is stunning, and more on that we'll, we'll, a bit later. later. But if you if you have ever gone to Osborne House, it still uh, hangs in a place of great prestige uh, there, this beautiful young boy. Uh, Maharaja Dilip Singh. In so, Osborne in the Isle of Wight. Isle of Wight. So, you know, th- th- this tiny little boy is now the only one who can be the Maharaja because everybody else has done everybody else in. And the court of Lahore is delighted, you know, because look, they've got a little boy, they've got a puppet. They can do whatever they want. They are de facto rulers, except one woman gets in their way. His mother, the kennel keeper's daughter, who is never meant to amount to anything, who everybody teased, says no. I will come out of the Zanana, I, the women's quarters. I will sit with my son in my lap and I will rule for his interest. She has a brother who's going to help her out in this. Unfortunately, her brother is a bit of a louse. Uh, he is a wheeler dealer, Del Boy type character who is deeply unpopular. You know, they're both, you know, these terrible, terrible siblings in the view of the, the very noble blooded Lahore Darbar. Who on earth do they think they are that they're going to take control and they're going to tell us what to do? So right from the get-go, right from the moment Dilip Singh assumes power in Lahore, there is frothing and discontent. And who likes a froth better no than the one, British? No one more than the British. So, yeah. What, yeah, so what is the thinking? What's the calculation, the calculus going on among the British at So this time? the British have been preparing for this. And again, we should be careful to say this is not the British government. This is still the East India Company, which which is, you know, like Google or Facebook or ExxonMobil, is a corporation. It's run by its shareholders. Increasingly now, the British government uh, has turned it into something like a public-private partnership, but nonetheless is self-governing. And... Um, Waiting in the wings, uh, the, the company has put three quarters of its Bengal army directly on the Sutledge. And there's this huge uh, cantonment um, and, and, there's, and there's a whole spying machine also, rather like uh, uh, Berlin in the 19th, uh, 1930s or 1960s um, with this whole spy network that everybody um, spying on everyone else, uh, Ludhiana. Uh, is the British centre of espionage, and they're sending out um, I- Indians dressed as pilgrims to measure the Himalayas. They're worried about the Russians just over the Afghan border, and it's a huge centre of intrigue. So this is the, the, very much the era of the beginning of the Great Game, mm. uh, and there are two things that the British are spying on out of Ludhiana. One is the Russians, over who are heading at a rate of about a hundred miles every decade southwards to walk through what is now Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan and so on towards the Afghan border, towards the Oxus. And they're also spying on the Lahore court. And they've been waiting for this. They know that uh, while Rajat Singh is alive, there's no way that they, with his Napoleonic generals, it's just not going to be worth uh, uh, invading. But as soon as they can create dissension and factions, they mm. can take advantage. And this is what they've been doing throughout India. Um, at, at this stage, funny enough, the, the British do not use the phrase uh, divide and rule. It's such a, a thing. I've, I've always been looking out for it in all my historical research in the in the primary sources because it's such a thing in the secondary sources. People sure. always say the British divide and rule. They didn't use that phrase at this period, but they certainly did it. Yeah. Uh, and they knew how to take advantage of divisions. They'd done this in Hyderabad. They'd done this uh, with the Marathas in particular. They'd, they'd, they'd taken all the different Maratha uh, kingdoms and set them against each other, particularly uh, Lord Wellesley had this brilliant stratagem just a few years before this, um, when they were taking on the, the the great Maratha army, which was like the Sikhs, was was run by European mercenaries, had fantastic cavalry, fantastic uh, artillery, and what they managed to do was they managed to capture a letter from one Maratha leader, slagging off the other, and then let it let it look as if it had fallen into his hands by mistake, so that um, Holker and Sindhya, who were the mm. two leaders, ended up not joining forces, and the company could take them out one by one. Exactly the same now happens. Well, that's in, what in they're Lahore. doing in the court yeah. of Lahore. So they know that people are really fed up with Jindan and her awful brother. So they start doing some deals. They say to her vizier, the person who should be advising her, and one of her generals, when the time comes we will ask you to betray your king. And if you do betray your king, 
we will reward you. We will reward you with your own kingdoms. We will carve this place up and we will give you, we'll make it worth your while. And that's exactly what happens. So 1845, we know? 1845. So we're in 1845. Jawara, the brother of Jindin, is because emboldened by this, this idea that these two are not going to be here for long. You know, the British are making promises and there is, it's such a restive kingdom. Little Dalip is on an elephant with his uncle. And the court comes around the elephant, the, 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 the faithful, you know, the, the really faithful Sikhs come around and they surround the elephant. And they say, this man is, is a drunkard and he's dissolute and he's immoral. And he's also spilt royal blood. They say that he's intrigued his way and he's been part of this poisoning plot to get rid of rivals. They pull him off the elephant and they cut him to pieces and the blood splatters little tiny infant Dalib. It's one of his earliest memories is of being covered in his uncle's blood. Without him, now this is a really exposed queen and a little boy with very little to protect them. And it is in that situation that the first Anglo-Sikh war takes place. And it's one of the great, most hard-fought conflicts of, 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 of the East India Company's military history because they're not taking on old-fashioned Mughal armies who are using outdated cavalry techniques. The Sikhs can match them gun for gun, musket for musket. In fact, in many ways, the Sikh guns are rather better than the East India Company ones. They've got these extraordinary artillery uh, makers in Lahore who've come from Europe. Uh, and, uh, and, so, and, and the East India Company knows this and, and, and realises the only possible hope is if they can create the division that they've just managed to do. And they do. And, you know, the two men that they've paid off do betray their king at the right time. And even when they defeat the Sikhs in battle, they realise that they can't just march in and conquer the country and move in in the way they did, for example, in uh, in, in Tipu's kingdom in the south, because they realise that the Sikhs are united against them and and that the, it'll it'll be a disaster. So they come across they come across they create a very sort of clever technique dip, dip, for a diplomatic solution. A diplomatic solution. A diplomatic solution where they say, look, we come as friends, and you're an unstable kingdom, and we don't like this kind of instability, and you mustn't like this kind of instability. <laughs> Let us help you. So we will be friends. We will we will rule this place in your name. You, you can still be the Maharaja, little boy, and your mother, <laughs> if she must. <laughs> uh, but, you know, when it comes to your age of majority, we'll leave as friends. And that way we have a and huge we will protect ally, and we'll protect you. Now, you know, everybody, t again, Lahore's been through a lot <laughs> at the moment. So everybody starts breathing a sigh of relief. Generals stand down, armies are at rest, they go back to their fields. But one person is not quiet, and that's Rani Jindan, who is screaming at her courtiers, what are you doing? She shouts, you know, what are you doing? Do not trust them. They are biding their time. They're going to take everything. And in the meantime, this sort of bemused little boy with, it doesn't matter, this tiny spindly little arm with this big diamond on it, which is completely outweighing his mass and also his ability is there on show. Now, there's somebody, again, who's got a close eye on this diamond because <laughs> the British are there and, you know, they're, they're quite happy for a while, you know, under Henry Harding. This is a good arrangement. He doesn't want to take Lahore. It's too hard to but take Lahore. But we've got a new man in who is yeah. Dalhousie. Now tell us a little bit about James Andrew Brown Dalhousie. So Dalhousie is the classic sort of ambitious old Etonian uh, who is hoping to, on, when he retires from being viceroy, to become foreign secretary or even prime minister. I can't imagine a, a modern trajectory like that. that. Yeah. Uh, and he is, he's bright and ruthless and um, he realises that what he wants above all, although he's actually employed by the East India Company, is he wants to give the Koh-i-Noor to Queen Victoria. And that will keep, in a sense, his his place at the uh, uh, in Downing Street warm for him because with the Queen's influence, with her support, who mm. knows what's possible. Uh, so he has this plan all lined up. But the first thing he needs to do is to get rid of Jindan. He needs to get rid of Jindan, and that is what happens. So Jindan is removed. She's called, first of all, they start actually disparaging her and undermining her. So they start referring to her the, in British circles as the Messalina of Punjab, the whore of Punjab. They start to reseed the gossip of his childhood that this is not the legitimate child of Ranjit Singh. Ranjit Singh claims him as a legitimate heir, but no, they say no. He is the product of an affair between his whore mother 
and a water bearer, a bishti, in the court. So he has not one drop of this noble is, this blood. This is the story they put out. The propaganda. That Almost goes certainly out. not true. Yeah. And then, well, I mean, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? But they don't know. Yeah. <laughs> who knows? You know. Um, so they drag away his poor mother. To actually a rather nice place, to Shekhapura, where uh, <laughs> there is, I mean, if you're going to be locked up somewhere near Lahore, it's not a bad place to begin your exile. The the palace where she was is still there, and it's got the original frescoes. It's one of the mm. great sites. If everyone uh, had the chance to visit Lahore, go out to Shekhapura. And there's two lovely things. One is a gorgeous lake with a octagonal uh, structure built by the Emperor Jahangir, the Mughal Emperor Jahangir, for his favourite deer. Oh. Um, uh, it's called the Hiran, Hiran Minar. Mm. And then next to it is this extraordinary palace full of frescoes from this period. And anyone interested in art history of, of, of the Pahari Art School and Sikh Art needs to make a beeline for this because they're they're completely intact and completely perfect. So this is where Rani Jin is, is, is sort of rattling around, unable to leave and under house arrest. Although, I mean, I don't think any frescoes or any number of frescoes in the world will, will help her heart because at the moment she is in absolute agony. And we know she's in agony. She's been separated from her only child, her only child who is a very small boy. And she writes these absolutely pitiful letters to Henry Harding, the resident of Lahore, saying... Just give me my son back. Please give me my son back. He's all on his own. He has nobody with him. I won't I won't trouble you again. I won't ask for anything. I don't want anything. Just let us leave. Just give me my boy. Please just give me my boy. And Harding's actually moved by these letters. But Dalhousie, not, <laughs> not one yeah, yeah. bit. And now the stage is set with the little boy king all on his own for the final, final act of the British takeover. And it's it's provoked, by the, I think, by the British moving yet more forces up to the Sutledge border. But already, I think, three quarters of the Bengal army is, is camped out on the border, ready to invade, rather like the Russian forces building up uh, in the months before the invasion of Ukraine. And everyone, again, like the Russians, can see them, see them massing there. So eventually, a Sikh party cross the Sutledge into the British side um, uh, to make a demonstration of resistance. And this is the trigger that allows the, the company to, to, to move in properly. So, and the reason it's, again, it's one of those controversial moments in history is that it's a raiding party. It's a raiding, but a small party on horse that crosses the river. And the British say it's an invasion. <laughs> yeah. They say it's the, it's, it's the cause of spelling. It's the, the reason that they will go to war. And in in the swirl of rumours, there are some people suggesting that in fact this this raiding party is even put up by by the, the British, British side Hazard. to give them a reason. And again, we have some fan- extraordinary battles when oh Chilianwala is Chilianwala. just so bloody. I mean, talk about Chilianwala. That is a that's a it's one of the great conflicts of of, of mm. Indian history. Mm. And the two best armies of the time go at it. Uh, and in fact, the the guns from. Uh, Chilinwala are, are now in London. If you go to Chelsea Hospital onto the front lawns, you can see them all lined up there. Um, and next time you're at the Chelsea Flower Show, you can mm. pop around and see them. A rather unlikely place. And, and because the, 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 the British mm. were so proud of this victory, because it was their most uh, formidable enemy. Mm. But uh, uh, some of the generals are already in company pay. They've already been... Uh, the, the position, I think, of the of the artillery, for example, has been betrayed to the British in advance. Mm. And uh, it, it ends in the Second Treaty of Lahore, which mm. is 1849. And, and this is the one... This is the one that, that, yeah. that well, this settles. This settles the, the fate of the Kohenor and of Dilip Singh. Because actually, you know, this is Also, very... and this is important, but it also settles the fate of Lahore. Yes. And this is the treaty which gives Kashmir uh, to the Dogras. And so the whole, I mean, a lot of modern... Indo-Pak conflict mm. is centred on this particular clause of the Second Treaty of Law. So a lot of, uh, you know, in a sense, the what's often said to be the most sensitive nuclear trigger in the modern world, certainly up to Putin and and, and Ukraine. Uh, is the Lahore... Is, uh, uh, is armed and loaded by the Brits. Is armed and loaded by, by the 1849 mm. Treaty of Lahore mm. when Kashmir is given to the Dogra. So. Well, look, so, so now, 1849, um, you've got Dalhousie, Buhis, who's on the scene, who says, right, you know what, I want it all. I want all of it. So this Maharaj has got to go. 
So he's got to get out of Lahore. He, so this little, there's actually a, a really very powerful etching of this, which is the little boy. From the, London, from the um, what's it called? The Illustrated London News. Yeah, yeah, and he's standing surrounded by these epauletted soldiers, you know, speaking a language he doesn't understand with nobody who really cares about him anywhere near him. He's already, again, this now little, very elegant little seven-year-old, nine-year-old? Mm, nine-year-old, like nine-year-old, yeah, yeah. Of. And he has is forced to sign over everything. And, and the Koh-i-Noor is actually scheduled very high up in the number of things. So I think it's sort of, I think it comes right after signing over all rights to Lahore. But what, is, again, is, is crucial is that it isn't given to the East India Company. No. It's given to the Queen. Which, actually, there was no mandate. The East India Company goes wild about this. <laughs> They're like, who the hell do you think you are, <laughs> Dalhousie? diamond. We've yeah. spent all the money on the armies. We're the ones who, you know, have uh, lost all the blood and coin here. Who are you to give this? But he has a plan. Yeah, yeah. this is his. This is his fast track to power. And as also, well. they pub- they can't publicly say this. Because they can't, can't have it to the Queen. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, oh yes, Your Majesty. Hope you like. Hope you like yeah, it. Gift. <laughs> hope you like it. So there's the diamond is now in going to be going to Queen Victoria. Dilip Singh is sent away from Lahore. And even now, you know, there are laments in Punjab. It's really, I can't stress this enough. This is such an open wound in the psyche of of Sikhs. Punjabis in general, but Sikhs in particular, that their little boy king was so cheated and traduced and taken away. And, you know, there are reports of the time of you know, Lahore being lined with weeping people as their boy king is taken away. And he's taken away and he's given to foster carers. A Scottish couple, actually a really delightful Scottish couple. I think they're, they're, they're nice people, but they're still not his parents. He is is going to be sent away to Fatega, which is now in present day UP. And the Logans, it's worth sort of mentioning the Logans. John Logan is a medic and he is arguably the most honest man in Punjab. Apart from Beliram, he is a man who is entrusted with looking after all the gems and, and actually doing the inventory of the Toshakana. And his writings are really fascinating. And he's the one who first lays eyes on the Kohenor and describes it and the wonder of it and the heft of it. But he also, every single gem and coin, he is the one who's accounting he for it. Is, after the, the conquest, he is the one, I think, who gives the chit Yes, to the receipt. Dalhousie. Yeah, exactly and that. Dalhousie has to sign, I have received the Koh-i-Noor. The Koh-i-Noor. <laughs> that's right. There is, there is paperwork. Yeah. And the Brits are very good at paperwork. It's it's a very good for a historian, actually, the, the paper trails that are left behind. But, you know, having having given over the diamond, he gets the boy. He gets the king. And Dalhousie says, just take him away, far away, and just look after him. And he, with his wife, Lena Logan, become de facto parents for the little boy. Where is Rani Jindal at this point? She has been locked away, but she manages to get one loyal to her to come who delivers food with a basket of clothes and she leaves dressed as a, a washerwoman. So she sneaks out into the night somehow, and goodness knows how, because she hasn't got means and she's, you know, worth a lot to the British. She makes it all the way to Nepal. Amazing. And she throws herself on the mercies, the tender mercies of the Bahadur of Nepal. Turns out, not very merciful because he knows that she's worth a lot. So he gets in touch with the British and goes, you might be interested in who I've got (laughs) here. Do you want her? And the British say, no, actually just keep her. You just keep her because when she's with you, she's out of trouble. And he keeps her and she sort of lives in sort of house arrest in Nepal. Uh, So she's in Nepal. She's living a comfortable life, but she can't, she's not free. It's sort of a glorified house arrest. And and Dilip Singh in the meantime is being brought up by a very sweet couple, traumatised, one must imagine. This boy's been splattered with blood not so long ago, has seen his kingdom fall, has seen his mother taken screaming away from him. And he tries almost immediately to be the best boy. Can I be the best boy, you know? And he learns to do... British, yeah, he parlor, puts away sing British parlor songs. Yeah, par- sing, yeah play little, you know, blind, blind man's bath. He puts away his Persian poetry. Picks up Shakespeare. Shakespeare. He puts away all of the Sikhism of his past, and he starts reading the Bible. And this is the point when he kind of really breaks the heart of all of all the Sikhs. Well, already because... a grieving, grieving Lahore who've lost their king, and it, it happens over a number of years. So. He, he becomes more and more inquisitive about Christianity. He's absolutely obsessed with the Rani of the world, you know, Victoria, this this mother figure who, you know, he's told is the, the mother who of the he empire. he started writing to. Yeah, and who is enchanted by him, who thinks he's utterly fascinated. She asks for reports, regular reports about Dilip. And, you know, he's beautiful. He is charming. 
He speaks very good English. This is a woman who's never going to see her Eastern Empire, but she has this totem of what it is to be Maharani of India. And so, you know, there's this sort of dual obsession which starts developing between this little boy and this queen in England. And we'll come to that in a minute. But in the meantime, the diamond. So the diamond is still in Lahore. Dalip is safely out of Lahore. And the diamond, now Dalhousie has to get it the hell out of law <laughs> because, you know, as long as it stays in the Punjab, there is a chance somebody else will steal it and then they will have the emblem of power and he can't have that. So the first, there's some wonderful stories at this point. In the, in the, uh, we've had in previous moments... We thought this moments, was going to be a three-part. Yeah. It's not, is it? We're going to four parts, aren't we? We're going We're for going an for epic. Uh -huh. So there's, 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 there's some wonderful little moments in the history of the Kodor. There's that moment we've already had when uh, it ends up as a paperweight on a, on a mm. Muller's desk. He doesn't realise what it is. Now... Um, Lalhazi decides to become the kind of diamond runner himself, doesn't he? Oh, it's, it, I mean, it's so hilarious. So, you know, this, this is, first of all, the, the diamond, when it's signed over and he signs the chitty, is given to a, a group of three wise men who are in Lahore, including a man called John Lawrence, who's this swashbuckling uh, character who's a, who's a great soldier. John but Lawrence, I should say, is, 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 is rather a hero in that uh, he's one of the few Brits from this period who, who stands scrutiny from our point of view today. Yes. And um, Absolutely. in years to come, when when the, the great uprising, the 1857 mutiny breaks out, which we're going to talk about in a later podcast, uh, it's John Lawrence who stops the massacres and then yeah. actually saves quite a lot of Mughal Delhi from destruction. There'd been a plan to destroy the great Jama Masjid, arguably the greatest Mughal mosque of all, uh, and replace it with a Gothic cathedral. We haven't got that Gothic cathedral, thanks to John Lawrence. Thanks to John Lawrence. Anyway, at this point, though, one of it, he's not particularly interested in jewellery and bling. No, so this is the problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's not one of his finest moments. So he's given the diamond to look after because, you know, he's a very brave man, a very strong man, and he takes the diamond and he puts it in his waistcoat pocket and he says, I will look after it, Lord Dalhousie, until the moment you need it. You can rely on me. <laughs> and he probably forgets where he puts it. <laughs> so when Dalhousie... The most valuable year, diamond in the world goes missing. Crackers. <laughs> a year later, <laughs> roughly, Dalhousie then says, right, you know what, I'm going to get it out of Lahore because it's just too... It's, this rock is too hot. So we've got <laughs> we to shift the hot rock. And he says, okay, John, where's the rock? And John goes... Where's the rock? <laughs> oh, God, where's the rock? Moments, yeah, when you've lost your phone, you've lost where's your charger, you can't find your credit card, but it's worse. He, it, uh, I mean, so he goes home, he turns everything upside down. This is according to him. And according to the Boswell, sofa. the man who does his, uh, his biography, says, you know, he looked everywhere, he couldn't find it. So he shouts at his, his valet, like, you know, that waistcoat I was wearing that time. Um, there was something in the pocket. Where is it? And the guy goes over that rock. Oh, I just, I, I put it over here. <laughs> I mean, thank God. Can you so imagine? So the man has like, put it in a little drawer He's just put it in a little drawer somewhere yeah. safe from harm. And so he has no idea again what it is. Gives it back to Lawrence, who says, oh, my thank God. God. Thank God. And then gives it to Dalhousie. And you're quite right. Dalhousie doesn't trust anybody with this diamond because it is now really such a hot rock. It's political significance, it's value, everything makes it a target. So he has this very small circle of trust. The three wise men, including Lawrence, who were looking after it. He tells his wife, <laughs> he tells his nephew, and he himself is going to be the diamond mule to get it out. And Lady Dalhousie knits him a little muffler for I mean, it. It's a little purse. <laughs> she sews, I mean, honestly, this is a woman I guarantee is not sewed on a button <laughs> for the last 30 years. <laughs> and yet somehow, because she's trusted, she makes a little purse. Pouch, a kid's skin pouch with uh, loops around it for a golden chain, which will fasten around our housey's neck and around his waist. So if someone tries to grab it and you know slits his throat, it's still attached to his body from the waist. I didn't know that. It's like around his neck. Too. Around his neck and around his waist. So it is now doubly secured on Dalhousie, who is now going to hard gallop it <laughs> with his nephew to Bombay to get it the hell out of India and over to Queen Victoria. And then they find, rather like with sort of British Airways now, all the flights are cancelled, they find that all the ships have gone off to fight some other war and they haven't got any ships going to There's London There's nobody for a bit. available. Yeah. And what they want is they don't want a big ship and they don't want something that's attracting attention. They want something that is fast, that is small, that is completely unnoticeable. And they have to wait for about a year until the that right long. ship, a year. So they finally find the ship and it's called the Medea. And it's a it's a sloop, so it's you know it's fast a steam, sloop. steam sloop. So it's you know one a very late technology, yeah, up to date, state of the art, and it'll get there quickly. The man who's in charge of this steam sloop is a man called Lockyer, 
And does he sends his nephew with it? He sends his yeah. nephew, and there is an official from the East India Company because they're still a bit ticked off <laughs> at this, this whole. Wait, I mean, actually, they do get their revenge because Dalhousie, in his mind, has this whole thing of "I give unto you, Queen Victoria, the Kohinoor," and they say, "No, <laughs> it's not yours. <laughs> We're going to give it to her. You can wind your neck in and stay at home." And he's furious about it. You know, he's really livid that these sort of apparatchiks are taking the glory from him. But that's the way. It is. So it's loaded onto this steam sloop, the Medea. Captain Lockyer is only told at the very last minute what he's carrying. The crew are not told, told at all. They just know that there is a casket which is being loaded on. And inside that casket is another casket. Inside that casket is another casket. Yeah. All of them have different keys. And each man is given a key. So not one person on the Medea can open all three unless they kill the other two. That such is the Brilliant. security of the diamond. Brilliant. So... Something tells me that this is not going to be an easy voyage, but we're going to save the, the save the story of the uh, the Medea and it, and its terrible journey to England for the next episode. Goodbye from me, William Darrymple, and, and me, Anita Arnon. 